Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so we've got, uh, we're, we're into our second class now of liquid-liquid extraction and uh, previous last week, Wednesday, so it f it's felt like a long time with the short break there in between, but we, we looked at a variety of equipments to implement liquid-liquid extraction and this slide here, slide 13, is a summary essentially of what we looked at last time. So we didn't see the slide last week but it summarizes what we saw there, where essentially we have, for liquid-liquid extraction on a continuous basis, we have to mix the material. Those three species, remember we gave specific names to them. We have our solutes, which we called A. We have our carrier, which we called C, and our solvent, S. We have to bring those three species together and mix them, contact them in some way, so that the mass transfer of the solute, so the solute and the carrier are combined, we call that the feed. And what our goal is, is to try and move that solute out of the feed and into the solvent. So we're, we're moving one species from the other. The moment we're doing that, there's mass transfer. And to get that mass transfer happening efficiently, we have to mix. And a variety of technologies um, exist to mix. You can, you can use impellers, uh, so the standard impellers will work, and there's a lot of um, interesting patents and technology around impeller design to get that mixing happening efficiently. You can inject the feed with nozzles. Um, you can even make the two feed streams meet in a pump, in a centrifugal pump. So just by pumping the feed, you're also mixing it at the same time. You've got a geared uh, teeth type devices. Um, the, the main idea, of course, is get good contact, get small droplets. Remember we had that discussion about uh, mass transfer and surface area. Um, but then you also have to settle. You have to decouple these phases from each other. So you'd like to then eventually separate the feed and the solvent after you contacted them. Um, and there's various ways of doing that. And there's a few listed up there. Um, now the technology shape, if you looked at the equipment in a plant and you walked by it, what would you be looking for? Well, it's typically a, a column of some type or a cylindrical vessel. And we looked at a variety of geometries. Um, here's a small pilot plant scale version where there's a cross flow, and we'll talk about that coming up. Uh, we looked at this uh, mixer settler design. Here's a cylindrical vessel design with a, a sort of a steel wool type barrier to, to create the separation there. Um, here's a settling vessel, a simple decanter and we look then at columns. And then as I said last class, you can either have nothing in the column, so here we simply have our light, our less dense phase trickling counter current to our heavier phase. Uh, you can add packing into that column, you can add trays into the column, and you can even make that column have some sort of a rotating device or a pulsating device where that, where that impeller not only rotates but also pulsates up and down to create the mixing. Um, and then here we looked at a more gentling, uh, gentler mixing when we don't want a foam forming. So if you recall that demo I, I, I did in class, I shook the oil, vinegar, mixture, and water. And um, you notice it took a really long time to settle. In fact, even by the end of the day in my office, it still hadn't quite settled because of that. Um, it created a foam essentially or an emulsion. So an emulsion is a mixture that really won't separate I mean, the, the classic example of an emulsion is mayonnaise, right? It's fat and, and water. And mayonnaise you leave in your fridge for months and it doesn't separate. So emulsions and foams, um, if you want to contact those, you need to do it gently and not so aggressively as some of the prior units. So the summary then of, of, of last class essentially was we've converted our problem from one problem to another problem. We've got our solute A inside a carrier that we'd like to separate and that's a tough separation and after contacting we've moved that solute now into the solvent but we still don't actually have the solute separate, right? Eventually you want to get that solute A separate from everything so you can sell it as a valuable pure product. So essentially you've converted your problem from separating the solute in the carrier to one now where you need to separate your solvent from your solute. Okay. And uh, we called this stream last time, we called that the extract. 
So you've got a different issue that you're facing now. So here's an example of acetic acid. So, so commercial production of acetic acid uh, works on the basis where you've got your aqueous feed acetic acid in water. It's about 20% acetic acid, 80% water. And that's a solvent extraction column. It's not a distillation. Okay, it's got the same shape. And then here what we have leaving is our lighter phase. Our extract is primarily water. Sorry, it's primarily ethyl acetate, the solvent, and the solute, which is acetic acid. So solute and solvent over there. And my carrier leaves down here. That's primarily a water stream in your raffinate. Now, there will be the other two species present in there as well. This is not a pure water stream. In the same way that the ex extract over there also contains all three species. And we'll see the equations for calculating the composition of the extract and the composition of the raffinate in today's class. I'll set up the theoretical equations and then we'll actually solve them by the end of the class. So now I said we've got this problem now where we've got the sol solvent and solute that we'd need to separate. And what we'll do then is use distillation to do that. So we feed that into the distillation. Um, and essentially what we have leaving here are our two streams. In the bottom we have my solute acetic acid. And here in the, in the distillate I have my solvent. So ethyl acetate goes off in the overhead, and I recirculate it around as my solvent. So we, we always recycle our solvent. That's a key point, right? We don't use our solvent once, and then we finish with it. Once we separate my solvent from my solute here, eventually I need to separate these two streams. My solvent is going to go back and be reused and recycled. Okay, so we see that here in this flow sheet. It comes off in the overhead and gets reused out here, my solvent. And here's my pure product, acetic acid. So that's good. I've got my pure acetic acid, species A. I've got my solvent, relatively pure, over here. What happens to the carrier? Well, down here, I've got my carrier, which is primarily water, with the other two species in smaller amounts. And I use a second distillation column to separate that out. And what we see in the second distillation column is that you have leaving is primarily your carrier water, which has got a bit of um, contaminants in it. It's not a perfect separation. But it's good enough that we can send that to wastewater. And in my overheads, I will have, in fact, mostly solvent, but I will also have a bit of the acetic acid out here. Remember, I said this stream contains all three species. So this is primarily water. This distillation column will send the other two species, mostly solvent and a bit of solute, and that gets recycled around. Okay? So that's essentially, if you look at a global mass balance, you've got your carrier leaving here, you've got your A, your solute leaving there, and you've got your feed coming in. And the solvent is in closed loop. Solvent just keeps, gets recirculated. Um, and we'll, we will actually, in practical situations, top that up a bit. Okay, everyone clear on, on where the flows of the three species are going? I've posted on the course website a different version of the same flow sheet that's got actual numbers. So you can see the mass, the mass amounts of the three species as they move through the circuit and then get a better understanding um, if that explanation, if you need an, another um, time to see that explanation. So let's, um, just before we move on, just quickly review this topic. This is in fact the hardest part of any solvent extraction is figuring out what solvent to use. Um, in fact, there's this quote here from the from book uh, by Schweitzer that I've uh, got referenced in the first slide. It says that the choice of your solvent um, has a more significant impact on the economics than any other design decision. So you may choose a great looking column, you may choose a horizontal decanter, and one might cost you a lot of money, the other will be, will be cheaper. But that's really not the issue. Your main issue is that solvent. That's going to cost you. If you don't pick a good solvent, you're going to lose money in several ways. One, one obvious way is that the solvent that you pick might not be appropriate, won't actually recover as much solute as you'd like. Okay? So you actually lose the species that you're interested in. But here's some other, some other criteria. Let's just take a look at that first idea here. High distribution coefficient for the solute. Okay, what does that mean again? Let's go back to one of the very first slides we had here was what's the distribution coefficient? Okay, and we had there that D, the distribution coefficient 
for the solute A, so D subscript A is the distribution coefficient for the solute, is given by YEA over XRA. Well, let's, um, let's recap those two symbols again on the right-hand side, YEA and XRA. What do those mean? Well, if we look at our solvent extraction or liquid-liquid extraction system, so we're going to build up on this. I'm going to head into quite a bit of theory here now, take the projector away, and we'll use all the boards to derive some equations. But essentially, um, let's look, put some numbers and symbols here. Y and YEA, XRA, what do they mean again? Our classic diagram is we've got my feed, I've got my solvent coming in, and down here I've got my extract, and over there I've got my raffinate. What are the, th the species? Well, in each of these streams, you've got the potential for three species. So in the solvent stream, let's just take a look at that solvent stream. You're going to have Y, S, comma, S. That's the amount of solvent in stream S. So the first S is, refers to the fact that this is stream S. The second S refers to the solvent. You've got Y, S for A for species A, the solute, okay? And you also have YS for the carrier, okay? Now, in your solvent stream, it's going to be mostly solvent and almost zero or very small amount of A and zero or very small amount of carrier, okay? In your feed stream, you're going to have XF S, the amount of solvent in your feed, you're going to have the amount of A in your feed, and you're going to have the amount of carrier in your feed. Okay. Now these are mass fractions, and so for every stream I can write three mass fractions for solvent, A, and carrier. So take a careful look here, I'm going to do something on the board. We've got three species in every stream coming in and every stream coming out. Solvent, A, and carrier. The sum of the three must add up to one. Okay? So if I specify any two, I can always calculate the third. So just to save some space, I'm, I'm just going to ignore the carrier in every instance. If I've got the A and I've got S, I can always figure out what C is. Okay? The sum of the three always add up to one. In the raffinate stream, I've got the same idea. Uh, three species, but let's just report XRA and XRS. And in the extract stream, I've got XEA, sorry, YEA, and YES. Okay, so the capital letters represent mass flows and the X's and Y's represent mass fractions. Okay, so if we look at the distribution coefficient, the distribution coefficient is essentially the ratio of A in the extract stream and the mass fraction of A in the raffinate stream. And we had this discussion last class that we'd like the distribution coefficient to be high. A high distribution coefficient it says that you're able to get Lots of A in the extract and a low amount of A in the raffinate. And that's desirable. You want your solute, A, to preferentially come out in your extract. You don't want your, sol your solute to be in your raffinate. The raffinate is essentially the leftover. It's your carrier and you hopefully have essentially mostly just carrier in your raffinate. And in your extract stream, you want primarily solvent and solute. Okay. So you want your denominator to be low and you want your numerator to be high. Okay, so that's, my, um, my, that's a recap of that theory. I'm going to come back to this uh, derivation here in a minute. Um, let's just go back to some of those desirable properties of the solvent that we had up there. Okay, so we want a high distribution coefficient for the solute. You can also write a distribution coefficient for the carrier. So DC 
is equal to y e c over x r c. Okay, so that tells you how the carrier, how much carrier is in the extract. Well, I said here earlier, you'd ideally like no carrier in your extract, little to no carrier in your extract, and you want a high amount of carrier in your raffinate. Okay, so maybe just you might want to note that here. So it's desirable that this is mostly carrier and that this is mostly solvent and solute. Okay, so perhaps make that note for yourself that this is the ideal situation. And if you can pick a solvent that will give you both of these two together, so a solvent that really picks up the solute and a solvent that does not pick up the carrier, that's a great solvent to have. Okay. So you want the, solute to, uh, the solvent to have two features, a high distribution coefficient for the solute. The solvent might also pick up the carrier, but you'd, pref you'd like it not to. Okay. And the combination of those two ideas is selectivity. If you what we say then is you want a solvent with high selectivity for the solute. That's essentially the combination of those two statements. You would also like a solvent that has a capacity to pick up lots of the solute. Okay? So as you can imagine, a solvent will start to extract and take out the solute, but there's a finite amount that it can take up. Right? There's only so much that you can dissolve in that, um, in that solvent, much the same way that there's only so much sugar or salt that you can dissolve in water before it can't take any more. So that term is loading capacity. So you want the loading capacity of the solvent to be high. Okay, so those are the, the primary features that you'd like for a solvent. These others down here um, are definitely important, but not as important as those first three. The reason why number four is important, the volatility difference between the solute and carrier, that's critical because later on you have to separate the solute from the carrier. And you're going to probably use distillation to do that, which relies on volatility differences. Okay, so it's no good having that um, volatility difference be close and then you have it, essentially what you've done is you've got a good separation here but a tough distillation afterwards. Ideally, you'd like a good separation here in the liquid-liquid extraction and an easy distillation afterwards as well. So you've picked your solvent to have that feature. Um, you want your solvent to have good density differences, so it will separate by gravity. Um, again, the idea of mixing and settling then. You want the solvent to be stable so you can reuse and recycle it. So some solvents will degrade over time. Um, you don't want that solvent to interact with the material of construction and then corrode it. So some solvents will corrode certain metals very strongly. Um, so picking a solvent that has these features as well as this inert property is, is important. Low viscosity, low surface tension to maximize mass transfer. You obviously, the safety issue is, should be actually right on the top of the list, non-toxic, non-flammable solvents. Though many, many accidents have occurred in the past. And I'll show you um, some, some slides at the end of the course where uh, that can lead to some serious damage. Um, when you've got a solvent that, leads, that lets vapors off and those vapors can be breathed in by operators and engineers and other people in the neighborhood um, and flammability is, is another critical issue. So picking a good solvent for those reasons and then obviously cheap, easily available, compatible um, and doesn't foam or form emulsions so are fairly self-explanatory. Okay? So a tough, tough problem. It's not, it's not always obvious which solvent to pick. And there's, there's books entire books that just dedicate themselves to giving the properties of solvents with solutes and, and carriers. Okay, so let's, let's assume then for the rest of this course that we've got a, a reasonable solvent, um, but that just illustrates the, the complexity with that choice. Now here's where I'm heading, um, and let's just take a look at this for a minute. So where we're going with this next section is we're going to want to derive some balances around this unit so we can tell how well it operates. Okay. So 
Before we start that, I'll just make a note here that capitals, for example, capital F, those are mass flows. For example, it would be something like kilograms per hour. Okay, and lowercase, those are mass fractions. Okay. And we'll always have that the three mass fractions add up to one. So for example, XRA plus XRS plus XRC equals one. So I've not written the carrier mass fraction here to save some space, but you can always uh, figure out what it is. Then the next important point in this derivation is to recognize that at steady state inside this tank, so if you want to visualize this as a mixer settler, we've got a mixing stage, we've got a settling state, there's a mixture inside there. And the mixture has a composition as, and a mass as well. So inside this vessel, there's a capital M, the mixture mass. And the mixture has a composition, which we'll call XMA and XMS. OK, so how many variables up there? Okay, this is not a trick question. <laughs> How many variables? 15, okay. Three variables on every single stream. So the mass flow and two mass fractions. And we've got that four, five times. S, F, R, E, and M. Okay, so 15 variables. We're going to need 15 equations. And let's figure out what those are. Okay, so that's our goal, is to write up the, ra the remaining 15 equations up here. Okay, let's figure them out. What might be the first one? <clears throat> okay. S plus F. Okay, 14 more to go. Maybe let me frame this in terms of a concrete objective that you'll actually be solving on one of these systems. Your goal is when you're solving one of these systems is to figure out pretty much how much A is in the raffinate and how much A is in the extract, right? That's you, really, if you think about it, how, much, how well is the system performing? That's your goal. And to answer how well the system is performing, you're going to need at least those two numbers. How much A are you throwing away in your raffinate? And how much A are you recovering in your extract? Okay. So those are really our ultimate unknowns. Yeah. OK, so let's do a, so, uh, so this is an overall mass balance. Let's do a solvent balance. It says S times YSS plus F times XFS is equal to R times XRS plus E times YES. Okay, so there's your solvent balance. And you're probably going to suggest next to do a solute balance. So let's get that one up as well. So S times YSA plus F times XFA equals RXRA plus E YEA. Okay, so solvent balance and a solute balance. What might be the next equation? Got a couple more to go. 
got the easy ones out the way. Okay, so maybe what I will have you do is discuss this with the person next to you. Also think of realistic assumptions in the system that will help essentially create equations for you. Okay, so discuss that with someone next to you. What are realistic assumptions on these numbers? What other equations might there be? I'll give you a minute or two. It's a mass, right? So all the capitals are masses. Yeah. Yeah. Can I make some assumption that, uh, for example, uh, x of s equals zero or near zero? Yeah. Yeah. And that's another. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so any suggestions on other equations, other assumptions that are reasonable? We've got a long way to go. We've got another 12 more. This looks like it's going to be a long class figuring this out. Other suggestions? There's, there's at least two easy balances that you're missing here. Okay. M. Okay. R plus. So there's two easy balances, and then a solute balance on the mass, and a solute balance on the, the solvent balance, sorry, on the mass. Why is that allowed? Why is that allowed? Okay. So at steady state, what's happening at steady state? Okay, so let me just put fake numbers on here. That might be 40, that might be 60. So what's M? Okay, so at steady state, you're putting in 40 kilograms an hour of S, 60 kilograms an hour of S, of F. So in steady state, what's in... What's hap this fictitious mixture, which doesn't really exist, but you can create it as, as one for working with the system, is 100. Then. Depends on the size of the vessel, okay? But that's, that's the true mass. But what you can see is almost like, think of it at, at least as a moment in time as a batch. You've got 40 kilograms an hour contacting 60 kilograms of an hour per hour coming in, okay? So there's a bit of a conceptual leap here, but... Uh, what I'm wanting you to think of is just take a moment in time, a snapshot, and freeze the system. And you've got 40 coming in in the S, 60 coming in in F, and the, the mixture M. So let's, not, let's call it a mixture M is then the sum of those two. And then my, it might be leaving here that this is 70 and that is 30 because you've got no accumulation. Okay. So... That mixture contacts, and the mixture, we've got the overall mass balance, but you've, you can also do a mixture balance for the solvent and the, 
and the solute. Okay. Now, so I'll, I'll, I'll write that up. Let's just write up the mixture balance. So M times XMA is equal to S times YSA plus F times XFA. So that's your solute balance on the mixture. And then you've got the same balance on the solvent. So M XMS How many equations do we have? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Got another eight more to figure out. Yeah, Michelle. <coughs> yeah, we can do write up two more for the raffinate and extract stream. Okay, so M X M A is equal to R. And R, the raffinate stream, we use X's. So X R A plus extract stream is Y E A. And then a solvent balance in the mixture resolves as the solvent leaving in the raffinate, X R S and solvent leaving in the extract, Y-E-S. <coughs> uh, F equals R plus E Y E S. F equals R. Sorry, wh what's that coming from? Uh, F? Yeah, so F equals R plus uh, E Y E S. It's e Y, where is that from? But so F is a mass flow. Is so let me just write it out. So just be careful of mixing masses and uh, mass flows. And so every one of these, this is a mass. You were using a mass fraction times a mass flow. So this is a solute mass balance. Okay. Right? So and where's this like something like F F plus S equals R plus E, that's a mass balance overall. So it's an Okay. So just make sure that you you got that distinction. Okay, so we need a bit more information here. And this is now where some simplifying assumptions come in. Which assumptions are valid that we could make? Or at least information that we'd have to specify. Yeah? Sorry, X. XRS, there's no solvent in the raffinate. Yeah? Okay, so it's probably not reasonable to put any assumptions on the output streams, right? Because the output streams are a function of what happens inside this tank. We can certainly make assumptions on the incoming streams. Okay, and what would, might those be? Michelle? No solvent in the feed, so XFS is zero. Okay, or we specify some other number if we if we know it. Any others? Sean? Um, how about if we assume YSA is zero, then we pulled all the solute out? Okay, so that the sol there's no solute in the solvent, so we might be using a pure solvent, or we're able to get our solvent at least pure enough if we're recycling it. And that yeah, and you'll see, uh, we'll see, um, 
if you were recycling it, you would know what's coming around from your distillation column from a simulation. Okay. Um, other other assumptions you could make is you would always specify F. Right? You would know when you're designing this what you're designing it for. So what is your feed flow? Okay. And another assumption that you'd need or know is at least how much solvent you're going to use. That you'd specify those. You would also specify what amount of solute you have in your feed coming in. So you know what's coming from your upstream process at you, so you know how much A is in your feed. And your solvent stream, you'd specify the purity of the solvent. So you'd know that e either that's a number of one, So where, where are we at here? We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 equations. Can we solve this? No. There's some redundancy here. OK. What you're starting, we see, see some redundancy here in these two equations. OK. And in these two equations. So essentially in these four, you can reduce them down to two. Um, in the concept of 3E, you've basically got a linear, linear dependent system here. Okay? So in fact, the true number of equations that are unique and linearly independent are 13. There's two pieces of information you need. Okay? And the two pieces of information we need come from a phase diagram. Okay, so you'll remember, let's take a look at, at some of that. I'm going to have someone else teach that to you because they've done a better job of it than I can. Okay, so this is a video. Um, it's on the course website. And essentially what we're going to do is you'll recall these triangular diagrams that you've learned about in chemistry, right? So we're going to, this video is a recap of what these triangular diagrams are about. Just to um, perhaps uh, while this, okay, the projector's here warming up. Um, essentially, you'll recall from this diagram that you've got your three species. And by convention, we'll put A at the top, okay? So in this video, we've got acetone at the top. Acetone happens to be my solute, and it happens to also begin with A, but that's coincidence. We'll normally put A at the top, our solute. And then on the left and the right, we'll put our carrier and our solvent. And the, they, those can interchange. So don't, don't learn patterns in this drawing. Just You have to learn what's actually going on in the drawing. But often you'll see, for example, the carrier in this corner. And in this corner, you'll see the solvent. But sometimes you'll see the solvent here and the carrier there. Okay? But almost always you'll see the A, the solute at the top. Okay, so let's, uh, let's learn how these diagrams work again. Um, and this guy's going to explain it to you. So we could take something that's partially miscible, three species, water, acetone, Everyone here.
case, rich phase. The water rich phase. Okay, so I'm just going to pause it over there. Everyone clear how the 53, 38, and 9% is read off the plot? Okay, so if MIBK, um, you can't see it here, it's been cut off. MIBK is your solvent and water is your carrier. We say that we've got these two streams splitting out in equilibrium from each other. One of which is your extract, one of which is your raffinate. Which one is which? So one of these is the composition of your extract and the other is the composition of the raffinate. Which one is the raffinate, which one's the extract? Let's take a minute to think about it, recap what, what the definition is for those two. Okay, which one on the left? Uh, on the left is raffinate, and on the right, extract. Okay. The extract stream is always the stream that is solvent rich, that's got the most solvent. So if we look at the solvent, MIBK, it's 100, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, it's somewhere, as, as shown here, 53% MIBK. There's 53% solvent in this stream. This stream leaving over here only has about 10% solvent. Okay, so this stream is far, far less solvent. There's more solvent. That's the extract. Therefore, the other one's the raffinate. Okay? If I switched this diagram and I made it a mirror image for you, and I put MIBK over here on the left and water on the right, extract and raffinate switch sides as well. Okay? So don't memorize that extract is on the left and raffinate's on the right or the other way around. That, that's never going to hold. Um, it's not a good way to learn it. So use the definition of extract that it's the, that's the stream leaving that's got rich in solvent. Okay, so then I'll just let the guy continue on. So we just go to the other side, and we're going to look at about, I'm going to say 67% water. Then we go up towards acetone, so it's about a little higher than 25, somewhere between 25 and 30. So we'll say 28.8% acetone. That leaves us with 5 weight percent K, which is right around that line. So that looks pretty good. So we started with the equal separate rich equilibrium at 25 degrees Celsius we get two phases with the following compositions. Okay so I made a mistake that I said 10 percent it was five percent. Um, okay so take a look at that video there's the hyperlink in the course notes um, if you need to watch it again and, and recap how that that works. We're going to be using those diagrams over and over coming up. Okay now there's another concept that you learned in those diagrams back when you saw them in chemistry, and that's the lever rule. Let's take a look at the lever rule. Um, again, an important idea. Oh, thanks. So the lever rule um, is, applies to any connecting two points on the diagram. So I'm going to, in fact, I'm not even going to draw the phase envelope for you. Okay, so the phase envelope is this arced line over here. The lever rule doesn't depend on that, but the lever rule tells you that any two points, let's call this point P and this point Q. Okay, so I take an amount of mixture P with a certain composition given by that point. So this is really all I'm concerned about, is how much P and what composition it is, how much Q and what composition that is. So I take these two different amounts of two different compositions, I combine them together, I mix it up, what is the composition and amount of the mixture? Okay, so the amount of the mixture is easy, K is equal to P plus Q, that's a simple mass balance, but what is the composition of the mixture? Well, the composition of the mixture is somewhere along the line that connects P and Q. Okay. We know that it's going to be somewhere along that line. We just don't know where. So let's put it 
over there. I'll just call it K for now. How do I know K is at that location, specifically that point, is what the lever rule tells us. The lever rule says that length, let's use this notation here, PK over length KQ. So the ratio of the, these two lengths, so I hop once to point K, I measure another time from K to Q, I take the ratio of those two lengths in millimeters or whatever units, and that ratio is equal to the ratio of the masses that I combine. So I'm just going to continue this equation is equal to the mass of Q over the mass of P. Now you'll notice something interesting. If you just read across the numerators, you must always see the three letters, P, K, and Q on the numerator. Okay? If you read along the denominator, you get K, Q, and therefore the other letter on that side is P. So that's the easiest way to probably remember it. Okay. So I want you to think about this. This is actually... Uh, if I ask it to you this way, find where point K is, you can write out this equation and find point K because you know the mass of Q, you know the mass of P, and you'll find point K so that this ratio of the lengths PK to KQ give you the same ratio as on the other side. Now I'll show you a little shortcut because that's really tedious. The little shortcut is you could also write the following. length of PK over length of PQ is equal to what, what ratio of masses? What's on the numerator? Mass of Q. What's on the denominator? K. Okay. So it also works. That lever rule also works in the same way. Mass of Q you know, mass of K you know. The mass of K is just the sum of P plus Q. Mass of the length of PQ you usually measure. You know where P is, you know where Q is, you measure that distance, so you've got it. And then all you need to do is back calculate from that the last length, PK. And that easily finds where K is on that line. Okay. So the lever rule is up there as presented. This way, though, requires you to measure two lengths to figure out where K is. This particular version of the lever rule, same idea, um, just requires you to figure out once where point K is. Okay, so that's a little bit more useful and a lot faster in a test or exam. Obviously, all of this presupposes you have a ruler with you in a test or exam. Okay, so please make sure you do that for the final exam. Okay, so we'll uh, continue this example in class tomorrow and uh, with some practical numbers.